Thank All the best, much, everyone. Thank you. Okay, I think we are going to start. We are about 101 participants. Give um, one more minute for the last one to join. Good morning and good afternoon, Excellencies, dear panelists and dear colleagues. Thank you for joining us for the presentation of the study, Good Practices Emerging from the UPR by Mr. Milun Kotari. Please note that this event is being recorded. My name is Mona Mbikai and I'm the Executive Director at UPR Info. Today, we are happy to be able to share the finding of the study, thanks to the valuable support of different stakeholders, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that commissioned the study, our partners, the Gannery, the Geneva Platform for Human Rights, and the Interparliamentary Union. We thank you also all the state, national human rights institutions, civil society organizations that have participated to the study. The study is available on the OHHR website as well on UPR Info website. The link can be found in the chat. The study highlights emerging good practices from seven countries drawn from the first free cycle of the UPR. The seven countries covered by the studies are Denmark, Georgia, Kenya, Malaysia, Morocco, New Zealand, and Peru. Uh, you will see we will be presenting good studies relating to the establishment, strengthening of national mechanisms for reporting and follow-up, the establishment of national human rights action plan, the drafting of midterm report, and also the important role played by different stakeholders to support the implementation of UPR recommendation. The event will be one hour and 15 minutes long during the first part of of it, we will hear from our distinguished panelists, 
who will share their perspective on the emerging good practices on the UPR. And following their statement, we will open the floor to the audience for discussion and question. We therefore encourage you to take sign up by chat or raise your hand in the second segment to take this opportunity to share good practices on the mechanics. We are very pleased uh, to start with, uh, to share a video message from the President of the Human Rights Council, Mrs. Nazat Shamin Khan. Nazat. <clears throat> Excellencies, dear colleagues, Bula Vinaka and good day. At the outset, I would like to thank UPR Info for organizing this event to launch the study on emerging good practices from the Universal Periodic Review. As you all know, this study identifies particularly innovative national initiatives that allow for more effective engagement with the UPR process and thus helps to enhance the promotion and protection of human rights. Not only is this important work from which all stakeholders can benefit, it is also timely, given that we are all beginning to prepare for the upcoming fourth cycle of the Universal Periodic Review. Now is the time to begin considering how to ensure that the UPR remains one of the most effective mechanisms for the promotion and protection of human rights and how to even further enhance its effectiveness. This is particularly true, given that the UPR is the only human rights mechanism that places all countries on an equal footing. It allows for a comprehensive review of the human rights record of each country and provides all states with the opportunity to offer recommendations to each other under review on how to best strengthen the promotion and protection of human rights. Indeed, the effectiveness of the UPR mechanism has been recognized at the highest levels of the United Nations. The Secretary General, during the launch of the Call to Action for Human Rights in February 2020, called on us all to ensure that the UN makes fuller use of its human rights tools and entry points, including the Universal Periodic Review. In addition, in February 2018, the Human Rights Council held its annual high-level panel discussion on human rights mainstreaming on the theme of challenges and opportunities for the promotion and protection of human rights in the context of the Universal Periodic Review. During the discussion, the former High Commissioner for Human Rights recognized that never before had a global institution publicly assessed the human rights record of every state, identifying shortfalls and proposing remedial actions and reforms. I am pleased to recall that the widespread recognition that the Universal Periodic Review is a particularly effective human rights mechanism is matched by the Human Rights Council's efforts to ensure that all states can effectively participate in the process. Indeed, Human Rights Council Resolution 6 slash 17 and 16 slash 21 established and strengthened the Voluntary Fund for Participation in the Universal Periodic Review, which facilitates the participation of states in the UPR process. In addition, the resolutions established and strengthened the Voluntary Fund for Financial and Technical Assistance in the implementation of the Universal Periodic Review which provides assistance to states to implement recommendations emanating from the UPR. Excellencies, dear colleagues, before I conclude, allow me to recall the need to ensure that the Universal Periodic Review remains an effective mechanism for the promotion and protection of human rights and even further enhances its effectiveness. We must therefore protect the system from any attempts at politicization or confrontation. The UPR mechanism should remain a collaborative approach, the only guarantee for the continued success of the mechanism. 
In this connection, I encourage you all to closely consult the study on emerging good practices from the Universal Periodic Review as we begin to prepare for the upcoming fourth cycle of the UPR. I wish you all fruitful discussions. Vinaka Vakalevu, I thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Now I would like to give the floor to our distinguished panelists online. And we will start first with Mr. Gianni Magazzini, Chief of the UPR branch of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Gianni, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mona, and thanks to UPR Info for this uh, important side event and for giving us the opportunity to look more closely at Milun's study on emerging good practices. I wanted to make briefly three points. The first one is on the context of the study. And as you know, this is part and parcel of the third cycle of the UPR, which has been greatly focused on an implementation agenda fully integrated with the SDGs, as was described quite in some detail by the Secretary General report to, to the General Assembly in 2017, document A72351, as well as by the High Commissioner Bachelet in her report to the Human Rights Council in June 2019, document 41-25, a document which actually identified some emerging good practices from states in connecting better between the human rights agenda and the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, and highlighting the strong partnership not only with states and regional human rights mechanism, but also with the other national stakeholders, national human rights institutions, civil society organizations, and of course, parliament. We hope that this study will open up the way for more in-depth analysis, both in country, as well as in specific areas where the UPR has made a difference when it comes to the promotion and protection of human rights. The second point I wanted to make is, uh, where are we now with this third cycle? Just to say that as of today, we have reviewed 168 states. We maintain the 100% participation record uh, from the beginning of this mechanism in 2008. Um, and this in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, where actually the UPR Working Group 36 back in November 2020 pioneered hybrid modalities, which were then used up by the Human Rights Council from HRC 46 on. We still have an average of 20 delegates for every single state under review, often led by ministers, senior officials, representing multiple branches of the government, increasingly also the judiciary and the legislature. We have on average 100 states making 2.3 recommendations for every single state reviewed. And in the third cycle, we have noted that these recommendations are becoming sharper, more time bound, more actionable. And so this peer review mechanism, which is however informed by treaty bodies, special procedures mandate order, the work of regional organization, as well as the critical input of national human rights institution and civil society organization is yielding some important results. And I've been listening very carefully, not only to the reviews, but also the adoptions and the item six in the council where states indicates clearly what steps they have taken in order to advance in the promotion and protection of human rights. And we hear not only records of increased ratifications, removal of reservation, but also changes in law from ending capital punishment to criminalizing domestic violence or violence against women, from action on non-discrimination on all fronts to advancing the promotion of economic, social, and cultural rights, from protection of vulnerable groups, including human rights defenders, 
to the setting up of national human rights institutions with the Paris Principle or national mechanism for prevention and their opcat or the setting up and strengthening of national mechanisms for reporting and follow-up. The UPR is a continuing process. You, by the time you prepare the national report, you have the review, there will be then follow-up action, midterm review and preparation of the report for the next, next cycle. And the one most important element I would like to flag here is the consultation. The consultation among multiple stakeholders at national level. What have we done as OHCHR in this third cycle to facilitate implementation? Well, the High Commissioner writes a letter to the Foreign Minister of every single state once the outcome is adopted in the Council. And she provides also advice on areas that in her view require particular attention as we all prepare for the next cycle. We have a matrix of thematically clustered recommendation linked to a specific SDG and indicating clearly the state that made the recommendation as well as the position of the state under review. So identifying clearly recommendations that have been accepted by the states or that have been noted. We have also an infographic that provides uh, information on trends between the second and third cycle and also the links to the top SDGs and the areas where the states has made commitments, especially with respect to accepted recommendation. The advice of the High Commission to every single state has been strengthen your national mechanism of coordination and reporting and follow up develop an action plan on human rights, at least taking into account accepted recommendation. And thirdly, integrate that plan with your effort at the SDGs and certainly mention progress on that line also when you participate in the high-level political forum of ECOSOX when it comes to the voluntary national report. Finally, the High Commissioner has also recommended midterm reporting where state can take stock on a voluntary basis of what they have done midway to the next review and challenges of implementation. So that through UN funds, but also through bilateral action, including through ODA, um, more can be done to support states in implementing recommendations that they have accepted. As the President of the Council referred to the Secretary General call to action, I would like to end by saying, as a result of that call to action, we have developed a practical guidance on maximizing the use of the UPR, which has been rolled out to all heads of UN missions worldwide. This is an opportunity for the entire UN system to contribute to this implementation agenda. And I'm pleased to say here that together with UNDP, very soon, a repository of good practices of UN engagement with the UPR will be finalized and will be looking more closely into what the UN system is doing with respect to maximizing this mechanism when it comes to engagement and implementation and follow-up action at country level. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mona. Thank you very much, Jenny, for highlighting this important aspect of the impact of the UPR and practices. I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Milon Kotari, independent expert on human rights and social policy and author of the study. Uh, Milon is also the president of UPR Info Board and an advisory member of the board of the Geneva Platform. Milon, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Mona, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's really wonderful to see um, so many organizations coming together to co-sponsor and to see this tremendous turnout. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. I also want to thank um, the President of the Council, Nazat Shamin Khan, for taking out the time to make her excellent statement and OHCHR uh, for initiating uh, the study. The um, context of the study has been explained by Jani and the methodology is detailed in the study. I just wanted to mention that it's largely based on 
responses to specific questionnaires that were developed for different sectors um, and on online interviews. And I want to thank everybody who's participated in that. Uh, some of you are here, uh, are here today. Um, uh, Mona has mentioned the seven countries that were involved. Uh, the criteria to select the countries was essentially based on, on the scale uh, of activities at different levels with different sections of society on the UPR. And I will mention uh, the countries again, for those of you who joined later on, it's uh, Denmark, Georgia, Kenya, Malaysia, Morocco, uh, New Zealand, and Peru. And uh, it's great that some of the permanent representatives from these countries are also with us today and will be speaking um, from the floor. Uh, so instead of going chapter by chapter, uh, you know, summarizing the main findings of the study, I thought what may be more interesting is for me to um, to uh, focus more on what are the lessons uh, that have uh, emerged from uh, from this type of a study, and uh, and to just you know open up for for discussion on how actually we can go forward because the purpose of the study was essentially to to initiate a process where we need much more work on documenting uh, good practices uh, that are coming all the time from all over the world with the UPR. So the, the overarching lesson um, is that the UPR has spurred a collaborative spirit uh, that is demonstrated by various actors at national levels. Uh, the UPR has significantly opened up spaces at the national level for collaboration in various combinations, some of which we have not seen before between governments and NHRIs, uh, civil society organizations, parliaments, and other stakeholders. This collaboration has contributed um, to an overall increase in human rights accountability, uh, education, and monitoring capabilities uh, while raising awareness of the, uh, of the UPR mechanism. And, and any such form of collaboration, uh, we have learned um, between different national actors built around the UPR uh, can promote uh, further realization of human rights at the national level. Uh, as the UPR is a state um, peer review process uh, via the Human Rights Council as an intergovernmental body, the active involvement of governments um, in ensuring greater collaboration between various actors uh, at the national level is fundamental. So we see more and more national action plans on human rights. We see more and more thematic uh, action plans uh, we have um, from, from different countries on, on specific themes. Uh, we have an example in the study from New Zealand, which has developed uh, a national human rights action plan and, and, uh, and a number of other countries that have developed action plans on thematic areas, particularly on, uh, on, on women's rights. Um, and uh, the second, the second uh, lesson is that um, is the involvement of parliaments. Uh, parliaments, uh, it's particularly noteworthy uh, that parliaments have not been traditionally very involved in the international human rights processes. And in various countries, they have been contributing to the UPR process through scrutiny of government involvement, allocation of appropriate budgets, um, for human rights institutions, mechanisms and processes, and amendments uh, or drafting of new legislation to implement UPR recommendations. Um, we'll be hearing uh, later on from Akio Afuda from the International, uh, in, uh, International Parliamentary Union uh, with perhaps some more examples. I just wanted to give one example that is in the study from, uh, from Georgia um, that uh, the parliament uh, has a human rights and civil integration committee that is reviewing recommendations uh, stemming from various uh, human rights mechanisms, including, including the UPR. So parliaments from all states, um, of course, need to engage more robustly with the UPR and ensure state compliance with international human rights and humanitarian law commitments. A third example, a uh, third lesson uh, is the um, considerable increase of UN agencies uh, in, the, in the human rights process through the, through the UPR, through the UN country teams, because they have to prepare a UN country team report. Uh, so the active involvement 
of the UN system, um, where there is a UN presence, uh, you know, obviously brings greater integration of the international human rights instruments. Uh, we have an example in a study from Peru where UNICEF has played a, a very important role in, in, um, in, in following up and uh, attempting to implement uh, the, the recommendations on rights of children. They've organized workshops, um, meetings with public officials, uh, attempted to identify alliances and steps need to be taken for, for implementation. Uh, and a fourth, fourth lesson that is very important uh, is uh, as reflected in the, in the good practices in the report is the increased involvement of national human rights institutions. Um, the benefits that have accrued uh, from the use of the UPR as an entry point uh, for further engagement of NHRIs uh, with, the, with the human rights system um, are highlighted uh, in, the, in the study. Um, and uh, it's, it's very good that we have Commissioner Gerald Joseph uh, from Suakam, the Malaysian NHRI will be speaking on later, um, but it's very clear that further involvement of NHRIs um, can ensure a more rigorous monitoring process to hold governments accountable. And the active involvement of NHRIs um, as focused national institutions in the area of human rights uh, in all countries where they exist uh, should contribute to the improvement of uh, human rights situation. We have an example in the study from Morocco, where the um, National Human Rights Council uh, has, uh, you know, has in their annual reports uh, submitted memorandums on the amendment of the criminal law, has taken up the recommendations and has had an impact on some of the activities um, of the government. Uh, another important. Uh, Another important lesson is the uh, significant increase of civil society. Uh, I see this as a, as a major contribution of the UPR in bringing together, uh, in, in essentially creating national coalitions uh, of civil society organizations. And, the, and, and we've seen uh, the palpable sort of increase of, um, you know, uh, of colla the, the collaboration across civil society. And, and this has led to timely advocacy uh, with the diplomatic community, the media, and, uh, and the government. The study uh, highlights uh, one example from Peru, where the Colectivo EPU Peru um, has brought together different organizations and, and coalitions and, and significantly increased the scale of uh, human rights activity in the country. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, one aspect which sometimes doesn't get uh, much notice, but which has had a significant contribution uh, in, in enhancing the effectiveness of the UPR, um, which is the, pre the preparation of midterm reports. Uh, these, I think there are over 70 reports now, and, uh, and these reports have considerably assisted in illuminating the monitoring and implement processes, including creating rating systems so that we can understand at what scale uh, the level of implementation is. Um, and, and they're very useful because they offer a mid-review uh, mid uh, you know, opportunity and uh, ensure that attention remains focused at the, at the national level. Uh, we have also the development of, of tracking methodologies, uh, which is a Another sort of innovative dimension that has emerged from the from the UPR, where different actors, including governments, NHRIs, civil society, have developed tracking methodologies and tools uh, to monitor progress on the implementation of the UPR. We have an example in the study from Malaysia, where the government has decided to implement the national recommendation tracking database developed uh, by OHCHR that facilitates uh, the recording, tracking, and reporting, which is a very, very important dimension, uh, perhaps the most critical of, uh, you know, of, for us to see how effective the UPR is. Um, a seventh welcome aspect is, uh, Gianni mentioned this, is the, is the involvement and the, and the effort made by many different actors to link the UPR recommendations with the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 uh, 
agenda and during all stages of the UPR cycle. Uh, such integration is essential to harmonizing state obligations and activities at the national level and crucially to linking human rights uh, and development agencies, including cross-fertilization of the accountability uh, accountability mechanisms. We have an example in the study of the work being done by the Danish Institute of Human Rights in all their reports in linking the UPR and, and the SDGs. Um, so I just wanted to close by saying that the study, um, uh, the idea was to open up, uh, you know, for more systematic in-depth analy analytical research uh, involving national actors. And uh, I know that Mona is going to uh, speak later on about, uh, you know, what some ideas on how we can follow up. Um, but from a methodolo methodological perspective, uh, I think it's, it's really essential uh, to venture beyond uh, the good practices that are in the study um, to conduct in-depth primary on-site research that convincingly demonstrates um, that the human rights situation has actually improved the lives and uh, situation of individuals and communities. Uh, any such study will need to delve deeper into the impact of the implementation um, of the well-meaning plan strategies and methodologies that are considered as the institutional and structural uh, good practices, uh, and that constituted the major focus of this uh, of this study. Uh, the ultimate success of the UPR recommendations uh, has to be reflected beyond that as a positive and tangible improvement of the human rights situation on the ground. And this would also include uh, assessing uh, how countries respond to the COVID-19 crisis uh, now and in the post-COVID period that has to be systematically integrated into the uh, reporting and monitoring process of the UPR. Uh, so I want to once again thank everyone for this opportunity and uh, I look forward to the, to the other presentations and the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Milun, for highlighting the, the lesson learned from uh, the study. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to an important stakeholder in the UPR process, one national human rights institution, and I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Gerald Joseph, Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia. Joseph, you have the floor. Thank you, Mona. Thank you to UPR Info, Gunry, and colleagues for bringing this together. Thank you, Milun, for the report. Uh, I, uh, I know time is uh, tight, so just share some thoughts on, uh, on PowerPoint. Uh, so that uh, we can get on a bit faster. Okay, um, we've done three reviews in Malaysia and uh, the role of a human rights commission, I think is what uh, we were trying to inquire uh, how to, to, to take the for process forward. I think it's already a given, I think it was mentioned by Gianni just now that it's now business as known by states uh, that this is a practice that is accepted. Uh, so I think how do we push forward? An example I think was mentioned by uh, by uh, uh, Milon Nalia was the developing of the UPR monitoring metrics. So congratulations to the Malaysian government, not done before, first time tried, and it's ongoing, which basically means it's less headache over time when people, especially agencies, government agencies realize that this is institutional memory when officers change. That's the good part about this. Uh, the other one is also uh, the national processes for UPR needs to make people comfortable in discussing. And I think the uh, MOFA Malaysia did that by bringing many agencies for hours sitting together uh, with a consultant's help. And the Human Rights Commission was also actively participating in this. Uh, the, uh, the involvement on stakeholders, I think, became crucially important. Usually there's a set of NGOs who are familiar they use the mechanism, they, they, they put their recommendations or their submissions. That's known. You can check them up on the uh, UPR uh, website. But we are realizing there are gaps. Government agencies, because officers change, uh, a new person comes and you start all over again. So that cannot be the way. So there's a lot of work needs for consultation, dialogues, and session. Uh, the partnership, as I mentioned earlier, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is crucially important. And this, in this round, the uh, Malaysia MOFA takes the leadership role. And I think uh, while MOFA is good, uh, they need greater partners in other agencies. Uh, 
We realized one gap in the last UPR was uh, state governments or local governments were out of the loop. So a federal government conversation, while seemingly positive, may have lost the power. A lot of the recommendations and implementation may have impact uh, in at state or federal government. So that's why we moved to the word Sabah Sarawak is uh, across the seas in Malaysia, two states. Uh, and I think for the first time also, we were very happy that the Malaysian government for the first time has submitted its uh, midterm report. Uh, so they have submitted the commission, uh, our short name is Suhakam, has been doing it the last three rounds, but the Malaysian government has done it. And so, so now we have a real conversation and that's how it should be. Yeah? Uh, okay, so I, you know that the uh, international level, the Human Rights Commission, like the CSOs, must continue to engage with all stakeholders. So we did a lot of engagement in Geneva. Well, this is more memory of many of us not able to go to Geneva. So, so these are nice photos. Uh, so we met the government delegation, international delegation, and this must continue uh, as an NHRI, while the CSOs will continue also to do that and when there's a chance to deliver an oral statement. Uh, this is something new we did. We, we published a booklet on our UPR uh, so that there is an understanding of all the recommendations uh, in simple forms, in color forms, so that we could use it to distribute it out uh, to as many people in, two, in our national language and in English and also infographics. Uh, this is something we started for the first time. I think this also helped the government because uh, they, they, they don't have this at this point of time. Uh, so uh, I will close with a series of recommendations and reflections based on our, of our work uh, on this matter. First of all, it's clear there is a lack of understanding of UPR. There are few people who know know very well, but it's not spread wide enough and we need to bring uh, more people in if this is going to be a meaningful process. Uh, there's, a, there's a lack of political will to commit to recommendations and I say this only because one is it's linked to lack of understanding and also this oft used comment that this is a Western, uh, international, what has it got to do with a local, uh, national agenda? And I think that's where MOFA always have difficulty and that's where NHRIs play our role as CSOs to get other agencies to be committed to the recommendation. So the UPR metrics monitoring framework will actually play a good, uh, good way to take this forward. Uh, engagement with the parliamentarians. I know we have our colleague who's going to speak after me, uh, Kyo, but uh, in Malaysia, sadly, there are interests in uh, individual parliamentarians, but as a whole, we've still not made much progress. Uh, we were hoping with um, in the last government, we've had uh, different governments in the last uh, two, uh, three years, we've had three governments. So they, we don't have a specialized uh, uh, inter -parli uh, 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 parliamentary select committee yet on human rights. So there's no engagement, but this is an, a crucially important stakeholder. I think this was mentioned. Uh, we have this now and this should continue uh, no matter which government comes into place. Uh, the partnership with, uh, and this is uh, our, the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, so how come taking some of the recommendations, the difficult ones, the issue of statelessness, undocumented persons, and some of it has cross-border elements. And that's where working in partnership with our sister brother NHRIs across the border has been one of our ways to move forward on this agenda. We know that it's a state peer review, but the multi-stakeholder engagement is crucial if uh, we are going to make this uh, really meaningful for uh, in-house uh, for the country that is on, on, on the spotlight. Midterm report, uh, we need that because uh, if not, you forget, you go back to business and then coming to four years, you rush, scramble. That should not be the way. This should be our usual monitoring of our report card for internal purposes. So the motivation is, is that government knows that this is good for them in order not to forget. And it's also good for politicians because it's progressively increasing uh, good marks for, for politicians. So we must also send a to political parties and politicians that human rights actually is a winning formula. Uh, I think uh, governments need to play a greater role in uh, awareness among civil servants. Uh, they are quite re uh, uh, reactive uh, to international human rights norm as in Malaysia. So a lot more work needs to be done. If we have more opportunities for such engagement, even like this forum, that uh, would be great uh, for civil servants. But I think the burden is heavily falls on MOFA Malaysia uh, and also the NHRA has been helping them on this. Uh, the um, 
NHRI uh, formation or strengthening. Uh, this is basically, we, uh, this is more in the interest of having more NHRIs globally. In Southeast Asia, we have 11 countries, but five countries don't have a human rights commission. So I'm sure in other regions, this will be a, probably a similar number. We would want other governments to use this platform as a way to encourage a strengthened NHRI or formation of a new NHRI. And my final point is, um, as I think mentioned by Jani just now, was uh, strategic recommendations. Uh, it should not be broad, general. It should be specific, actionable, and time-bound because this is something we need to pick up in order to work hard for four years rather than broad strokes, uh, which I think is a, a skill we need to help even our own governments in giving more specific uh, actionable and time-bound uh, activities. So these are some of our learnings over the last few years, and we've, we've, we've shared that with Milun, and we've learned much more from his report. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Joseph, for sharing your reflection and recommendation on the UPR and indeed highlighting the important role of the NHI also playing a, a role as a bridge between government, civil society organization, and also with other federated entities, because everyone, uh, uh, all institutions uh, and different entities of the country have to be involved to, to make the, the UPR successful. So thank you very much for this. And also making a, a link with one important point you, you mentioned in your presentation about the role, important role of parliamentarians. I will give the floor now to Akio from the Interparliamentary Union. Akio, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mona. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to join you. And uh, thank you indeed for the organizer of that um, uh, uh, event. Uh, namely UPR Info or HCHR, and of course, Milun, congratulations on that work, even though you said that it is a, a common effort, but congratulations. Um, we were pleased to contribute uh, to this study, which is part and parcel of our effort uh, to support Parliament to, to promote human rights, including through the work of the Human Rights Council and its Universal Periodic Review. Indeed, um, Parliament can take the lead in critically reviewing the draft support report. Sorry, that the executive um, has prepared for submission to the Human Rights uh, Council. Parliamentarians can also see for themselves how representative of the executive present and defend their report before the council. Such direct exposure helps them to better understand the concern that the council expresses and facilitates subsequently an informed debate in parliament. Once the, the council has adopted its recommendation, it is critical that they are brought back to parliament and seriously discussed in particular because they often require legislative action and budgetary means. The recommendations are also very useful in that they give parliament a concrete tool to hold government to account for the human rights performance. Parliament play a critical role too in turning the reporting cycle into a continuous one. Countries only report every four years and a half to the Human Rights Council. There is a big risk that in the meantime, its recommendation end up in a drawer collecting dust. Parliament can therefore ensure that recommendation remain on the agenda by asking the executive for yearly progress reports. What do we do at the IPU? Being aware of this determined contribution of parliament to the promotion of human rights, and more specifically to the work of the Human Rights Council and its UPR, we developed a strategy focused on familiarizing parliament with international human rights standards. 
promoting parliamentary involvement in international reporting system, including the Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council, strengthening parliamentary capacity to promote and protect human rights through parliamentary, parliamentary human rights committees, and finally promoting a human rights-based approach to parliamentary work. We undertook, together with OHCHR and other stakeholders, including Gunnery, capacity building activities, regional activities, national activities. And among our action, once a country is scheduled to present its report before the council, the IPU Secretary General writes to the concerned parliament informing the speaker that the country will be submitting the report and asking their contribution to that report before submission in Geneva. Following the report, the review I mean, the SCG writes again to submit to share the recommendation with that parliament, inform, asking them to organize a debate to explore how they can contribute to the implementation of that report. We also, we privilege partnership. I said it, we work with OHCHR and I would like to see this opportunity to commend Gianni's team effort and also Gunnery, UPRM4, and I hope that in the future, we'll continue that collaboration. Let me conclude by sharing with you some concrete example of good practices. In Bhutan, for instance, national report is reviewed by the Committee on Human Rights, the Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights before submission to Geneva. And after the report is reviewed, the same committee invites the delegation that come to Geneva to present the outcome of that recommendation. Georgia, Minun, you refer to Georgia. Indeed, the Parliamentary Human Rights and Civil Integration Committee organized a hearing with the national delegation to present the outcome of the review. The same committee conducted regular feed visits to assess the implementation, the impact of the implementation of the recommendation. Field visit, and I said to, uh, to Gianni last time that uh, our champion is a former MP, Mrs. Uh, Sophie Kilatze, who now is a member of uh, the Committee on Human Rights in Geneva. And he's our focal point, I mean, the CRC focal point for the IPU, and I met with her last time. She is a very knowledgeable lady, a very commit committed former parliamentarian. He's a, a good example. I want also to share with you some parliament participation in the pre presentation of the report in Geneva. These include Barbados, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Chad, Cambodia, Zoto, Morocco, Mexico, Nigeria. Please note that this list is not exhaustive. Ladies and gentlemen, partnership is the name of the game which the IPU stand ready to contribute. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Kiyo, for, for your contribution and highlighting the important role of parliamentarian and, and sharing a very concrete example of how parliamentarian can be involved in the UPR process. Um, now, um, I would like now to turn to the second segment of the event and open the floor to question and comment for the panelists. I thank you to use the chat box or raise your hand to ask question. Uh, but before that, I would like also to welcome um, a couple of uh, permanent mission uh, that are present today. 
and from the country also participated in the review. And I would like to, to give the floor also to them for their remarks. I would like to start first with the ambassadors of Kenya, Excellence Dr. Cleopa Mailu. And I see already a couple of raised uh, hand raised. So we please keep, please do keep your, your question and we'll come back to you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, the DPR and I'm sitting in for Ambassador Cleopa Mailu, the PR who unfortunately was not able to join us this afternoon and he sends his regrets. Uh, that said, uh, I would just uh, read a statement uh, in acknowledging uh, what he intended to say. So uh, let me begin by thanking the panelists for their presentation and organizers for, the timelessly, for timelessly organizing this side event and for presenting this study on the emerging good practices from the Universal Periodic Review. Kenya's review of the third cycle UP, UPR was conducted last year in January 2020 during the 35th session of the UPR working group, while adoption of the UPR outcomes were held in October 2020 at the 45th regular session of the HRC. Since then, Kenya has made tremendous progress in implementing the 319 recommendations received. Indeed, the first two cycles of the UPR provided outstanding lessons that have significantly contributed to the ongoing third cycle implementation. Uh, excellencies, the government has developed a draft implementation plan 2021 to 2025 for the implementation of the recommendations that were accepted. The process of developing the plan was highly consultative and involved stakeholders from government ministries, departments and agencies, national human rights institutions, parliament and also civil society organizations. With the support of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the government in January 2021 was able to hold a stakeholders consultative forum and a validation forum in June 2021. The UPR draft implementation plan is currently undergoing internal approvals before it is publicly released. In view of time constraints, allow me to mention a few areas of positive developments that have been made since the last review. One, on relief programs against COVID-19. With the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, the government initiated the National Hygiene Program 2020, dubbed Kazim Tani. This is a 10 billion Kenya shilling government manual work for payment program designed to cushion the most vulnerable citizens in informal settlements, especially the youth. It aims to regenerate the economy through giving the Kenyans confidence that they can rebuild the country following the devastating effects of COVID-19. The program has employed 26,000 workers from informal settlements and is expected to employ more than 200,000 workers to cover 34 counties and so far has helped to keep the youth out of crime. In general, the program aims to uplift the local economic recovery as a form of social protection. Second, access to justice with operationalization of Small Claims Court. The Small Claims Court Act of 2016 established the Small Claims Court to hear and determine commercial disputes with a monetary value of less than a million Kenya shillings, which is equivalent to 10,000 US dollars. These courts continue to enhance access and expeditious delivery of justice to Kenyans, reduce the cost and time to hear, determine commercial disputes, and clear the case backlog of cases. Third, business human rights. Business and human rights. The National Action Plan of Business Human Rights was approved by cabinet in February 2021 and assigned a session of paper number three of 2021. The policy document has been tabled in parliament for approval. The National Action Plan sets out policy actions by government to ensure and respect uh, human rights by businesses operating uh, in Kenya. Fourth, right to property. The National Land Management System, dubbed Adi Sasa, was launched by the government in April 2021. This information management system enables the 
enables the capture management and analysis of geographically referenced land related data to produce land information for land administration and management decisions. The system seeks to upgrade all registries under one central management system and simplify services with ease of access to information and data services, and hence curb fraud and other forms of malice. Fifth, fighting sexual gender-based violence. The government in August 2020 launched Policare, a one-stop gender-based violence center model that was established to ensure uh, gender-based violence victims access counseling, medical and legal services from one place. This integrated approach to handling uh, gender-based violence, including domestic violence, encourages victims to report perpetrators. Lastly, in ensuring the effective implementation of recommendations from UPR, the government in March 2019 established a national committee on international and regional human rights to serve as a standing committee on reporting and follow-up actions. This ensures that UPR recommendations are implemented and as envisaged by government. In conclusion, Kenya reaffirms that the UPR continues to be an effective mechanism of strengthening national human rights protection systems. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much for, for sharing the experience of Kenya. And I would like now to give the floor to uh, the permanent mission of Georgia, the deputy ambassador, Mr. Irekli. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you well. Okay, great. Please go uh, ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank you again, uh, distinguished panelists, for their insightful presentations. Of course, UPR Info for organizing this timely event. And last but not least, I also thank Mr. Milun Kotari for his very important study, which uh, uh, Georgia is proud to be part of. Uh, we're confident uh, that uh, sharing good practices, innovative initiatives, and experience in collaboration between different national actors will serve as useful guidance and inspiration for states in the frame of uh, the UPR implementation process. Uh, Georgia's approach uh, and engagement uh, within the UPR clearly indicates and underlines my country's commitment uh, to the protection and promotion of human rights. Uh, in order to ensure effective implementation of undertaken commitments on domestic level, they are translated into the national action plans on human rights. Furthermore, uh, since 2016, we have increased the role of uh, Parliament of Georgia in this process, and now it is closely engaged in the UPR, including through monitoring of the implementation of the accepted recommendations. As during previous uh, review cycles, uh, the public defenders of Georgia, uh, uh, with the involvement, participation of the UPR info, pledged to follow up the implementations of, of these recommendations. Uh, in general, in its alternative reports, uh, Defender's Office is covering all UPR recommendations, both accepted and noted. Uh, also, as an example of another good practice mentioned uh, in the report, let, let me highlight uh, the Human Rights Interagency Council, chaired by the Prime Minister, which is responsible for coordinating the implementation of UPR recommendations. The Council underwent reform uh, in the beginning of 2020 with uh, assistance from OHCHR, which we very appreciate. Uh, another good example uh, would be the action plans for 2018-20, which uh, were developed for women's empowerment and gender equality. The Interagency Commission has elaborated an unified national communication strategy and action plan on violence against women and domestic violence. This document aims to contribute to the coordination and effectiveness of work of the responsible agencies and implementation of integrated state policy for prevention of violence against women and domestic violence. With this in mind, let me once again reiterate that uh, Georgia is honored to participate in the UPR process, and which we consider to be an essential mechanism for the promotion and protection of human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Iraqi, for your contribution and sharing the good practices from Georgia. I would like now to give the floor to the permanent mission of Peru, the second secretary, Mr. Philip Pons. Philip, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and apologies as well, my ambassador 
and RTPR was, was unable to make it today. Um, but we would like to thank the organizers of this important side event, um, Mr. Milun Kothari, for providing us with this very interesting study of emerging good practices from the, the UPR, and also the, the panelists for their very enlightening presentation. Um, Peru is happy to have been among the countries considered in this study on best practices associated with the UPR process, as we have been firmly committed to the UPR mechanism since its inception in 2008, and were one of the first countries to be reviewed during its second session. We're pleased to see how this unique mechanism has developed over its first three cycles into a process that is contributing to strengthening national human rights protection. And uh, we agree that this study is a timely exercise in taking stock of advances made as we look forward to the first to the fourth cycle. As with other countries, the UPR mechanism has helped to promote and strengthen national human rights protection in Peru, as is reflected in the study. This includes, for example, strengthening the process towards uh, the creation of Peru's national human rights plan, the institutionalization of national processes for the UPR and the experience of the National Human Rights Council of Peru. Um, also, the, the framework provided by the UPR process has contributed to reinforce the role of our national human rights institution and has also provided increased space for participation and monitoring by civil society. Throughout the, sport, the support of the UN country team has also been an, an important factor in improving these, these elements. Last year, Peru approved its intersectoral protocol for the participation of the Peruvian state in, international, in the international human rights protection system, which includes a specific line of action titled Dialogue and Reflection with the UPR. And this is aimed at uh, consolidating the consultation process with civil society actors, with our national human rights institution and other relevant entities in order to promote their participation in the development of UPR result, uh, reports, as well as taking part in, in dialogue with the wider international human rights protection system. Uh, it also con contemplates facilitating the evaluation of recommendations among relevant sectors, as well as promoting their implementation. I would also like to mention that with the help of the OHCHR regional office, the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights developed a strategy to implement Peru's third cycle rep recommendations in six departments of Peru, with a view to decentralizing the recommendations and promoting discussion on human rights uh, in a wider audience in Peru. I think it's clear that what we consider to be of crucial importance is that the UPR review process has created practices and spaces for dialogue within and among government agencies, with national institutions, as well as with civil society organizations. And all this contributes to the strengthening of national human rights protection. Um, like other mechanisms, the UPR has had to adapt to the challenges of virtual work and the UPR has been successful in this regard, especially permitting increased participation from capital-based officials during reviews. But we would like to ask the panelists, how have virtual means helped or hindered the best practices identified in the report as well as during the UPR sessions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, for your contribution. We'll go back to the panel uh, in a few minutes. I would like now just to give the floor to two of Pernod Mission uh, presents. Uh, first, I would like to give the floor to the Pernod Mission of Morocco, uh, Mr. Abdullah Boutafaget. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, let me first convey the apologies of uh, my ambassador or is not able to join you due to a confirmed commitment as uh, a president of the General Assembly of WIPO. Uh, also, thank you for our society in Morocco uh, with this important event and for having uh, considered Moroccan experience during the study published on the emerging good practice on the APR. It is certainly an opportunity for our country to learn from the, its points of uh, weaknesses, uh, but also to build on good practice to move forward in its resolute commitment to promote human rights and to enhance its interaction with the UN mechanism for the promotion and protection of human rights. It is, it is also an opportunity to highlight the importance of the EPR mechanism as an effective instrument and to advance the promotion and protection of human rights 
around the world, especially since it offers opportunity to contribute through dialogue and cooperation to the prevention of human rights violations. My delegation to still take this opportunity to reaffirm the importance of respecting the objective rules and principles that establish this mechanism considered the most effective of the Human Rights Council. We also underlined the importance of preserving the constructive character of the dialogue during the reviews, which must be based on objective and reliable information and in particular to avoid any attempt to politize this dialogue since unfortunately some parties divide the instrument from its objective and use it for political ends. Coming back to the study, I would like to congratulate Mr. Kotari on his excellent work. You have provided us with a very timely methodology for a substantive understanding for multiple experiences, which will be a great use to who are seeking to improve their exam in the future. Regarding the Moroccan experience, I recall that the third cycle of the Universal Period Review of the Kingdom of Morocco took place in May 2017 during the 20th, 27th session of the European Working Group. And in view of the next cycle, Morocco submitted a mid-term report in 2019. Morocco's experience is carrying out this review raises some comments, which we also highlighted in the study subject of our events. First, the collegial nature of the preparation of the exercise in so far as in Morocco, the preparation and examination of the national report under UPR and the follow-up of the resulting recommendation are ensured by an internal ministerial delegation in charge of human rights issues. Second, civil society and parliament, as well as the forces in the country, have been involved in the preparation of the various cycles, the recommendations of which are used as a tool to advance human rights in Morocco. In this regard, as mentioned, the earlier by Mr. Kutari in his statement, the Sindiash uses this recommendation as a roadmap in the implementation of its mandates and also in, in, in its interactions with the government authorities. Third, the EUPR has become a basis for discussion and the elaboration of unit development model in Morocco. And last comments, this review was extremely useful for Morocco insofar as it was at the origin of the establishment of a national action plan, plan of democracy and human rights adopted in 2018 by the government of Morocco in which 435 measures are included. Before concluding, I would like to stress the importance of technical, uh, technical assistance aimed at supporting the efforts of countries in need to strengthen their capacities, capacities particularly the last developed countries and small island development states. In this regard, allow me, uh, Mr. Giano Mazzarini, I, I want to uh, take uh, the opportunity of your presence among us to, to, to propose the launch of a study, or at least to organize a workshop to examine how can we apply these uh, recommendations of the present study in an action plan or in a tripartite partnership program involving, of course, uh, OHCR, beneficiary state, and state with experience to consider or inspiring those beneficiaries or an interested states. I thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution, sir. And I would like now to give the floor to Mrs. Vina from the Permanent Mission of Malaysia. Thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, first, uh, we want to thank the organizers today uh, for organizing this site event. Uh, we are also um, appreciative of the speakers for their insightful views, in particular, Mr. Milan Kotari. Uh, the UPR undeniably has contributed substantially towards the fulfillment of the Council's mandate in the promotion and protection of human rights globally. It has provided an equal, transparent, and collaborative avenue that enables all UN member states to hold continuous dialogue and enhance cooperation in the field of human rights. Uh, earlier, Mr. George Joseph has uh, shared uh, Malaysia's experience, including on the various crucial steps taken by Malaysia in institutionalizing the UPR at national level and galvanizing efforts 
from all stakeholders to ensure effective follow-up and implementation of UPR recommendations. So here, I just want to add that as a next step, Malaysia will be developing key capacities to strengthen the national mechanism for reporting and follow-up for the rollout of the national recommendations tracking database in a first workshop with the government agencies and OHCHR, which will be, take place on 21st October. Um, uh, at this opportunity, I also want to thank uh, our um, UPR Secretariat for the assistance and cooperation it extends to states under review. The Secretariat's facilitating role to facilitate is extremely indispensable, as experienced by Malaysia during our third UPR, as well as in the follow-up process. Uh, before we conclude, uh, Malaysia would like to seek the esteemed speaker's views on two issues. Firstly, Due to limited speaking time, we often, we often witness state, states either comment uh, and make recommendations to states under review without elaborations and opportunity to share best practices and experience, particularly to address subject matters contained in the recommendations. Very often also, recommendations are made on matters that states under review already know to have strong difficulties. How can these issues be tactfully addressed in order to optimize the review session? and to meaningfully engage states who are facing difficulties in implementing specific human rights issues. Secondly, categorization of recommendations, whether the recommendations are accepted in full, partially or noted, should be properly and accurately reflected. At times, states under review have difficulty in accepting recommendation that addresses several issues at once. This renders states to accept the recommendation impartial due to challenges in implementing the recommendation in its entirety. Partial acceptance should not be regarded as non-acceptance. Partial acceptance still reflects a commitment on the part of the states and should be considered and reflected posit positively. We, uh, we will be grateful for your views. I thank you. Thank you very much, Rina, for your contribution. I'm very glad that we, we have um, a lot of interest in the, in the discussion. I have noted a, a couple of questions, uh, but before we go back, I will summarize uh, the couple of questions that appear uh, on the chat. I would like also um, to give the floor to the Padua University. Uh, they will be presenting briefly, just an, uh, also a good practices, uh, the Padua UPR model that is also, uh, that has been developed. Uh, by the Padua University in collaboration with the OHCHR and UPR Info uh, to promote and raise awareness on the Universal Periodic Review. Uh, Ling? Uh, good afternoon to you all, Excellencies, honored guests and delegates, all protocols observed. Thank you UP UPR Info for giving us an, an opportunity to present what the University of Padua Department of Political Science law and economics work and effort towards the advancement of human rights and promotion of the universal periodic review mechanism. The University of Padova conducts an annual simulation of the universal periodic review, which we call the Padova model UPR. We invite bachelor, masters and PhD students from various disciplines such as law, international relations and political science to participate and role play as either states, NGOs, or NHRIs. The aim of this simulation is to spread awareness of the UPR mechanism by challenging students to critically think and research on current human rights issues. We also aim to promote a deeper understanding of this human rights procedure amongst the future rights, human rights custodians. We have successfully hosted this event for the past three years, and we are currently in the final stages of preparing for this year's simulation, which will be held in the last week of November. In the past two years, we have managed to attract students from all corners of the world because of the online platform introduced by COVID-19 pandemic. We recently published the model UPR handbook, which is readily available for use by other universities interested in conducting a similar simulation. We therefore hope to have some of you here today attend the event and witness the eagerness to learn and the effort put in by the students toward the, towards the reports, lobbying and presentations. 
The overwhelming support and, coll and collaboration of students is indeed a positive sign that the youth is ready to take a stand in upholding and promoting human rights all around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charmaine, for presenting the, the Padua UPR model. And I'm very pleased to say that we will be launching on the 1st of October the, the handbook on the Padua UPR model. That is really a, a great way, in fact, to, to promote human rights and, and, and the UPR and really create a human rights culture amongst the young people and in the country. So we have um, a number of questions, and we, I think we will go a bit over time if our panelists allowed. I think maybe we, we give each other uh, 10 more minutes. Um, so I will just uh, mention a, a couple of them and if some of you could, could please uh, respond to them. So first from Cambodia, uh, we have a question. So are there good practices to ensure the ownership of UN country team? And what could be the role of recommending states after the adoption, if there's any good practices to share? Uh, we have also uh, Nepal sharing uh, good practices uh, where the parliamentary committee uh, engaged with the federal and provincial assembly uh, to review the last UPR report. And I think it's a uh, and that is, I think, a, a very important element that really the, the UPR recommendation concern you know, all level of, of the government and to ensure kind of an effective implementation of, of the UPR recommendation. It requires really the involvement of all stakeholders, including at the regional level. And we have also a question from Kuno highlighting uh, the importance of the UPR in peace building and to prevent human rights violation. And the question is, is how peace builder stakeholders can further be involved in the fourth UPR cycle to prevent uh, human rights violation. And from the Geneva platform, Mr. Felix Kishmaier is asking, how can we best enhance a systemic approach at the fourth UPR cycle, which would better integrate the recommendations and view of special procedures and treaty body beyond what already exists, that is to say the compilation of UN reports. And then the last point, and how we can optimize the UPR session, and then the, the point also of the permanent mission of Malaysia uh, on the issue of um, recommend partial, what normally the recommendation are either officially supported or noted, but uh, this discussion about uh, uh, accepting, if we can say partial uh, acceptance of the recommendation. And then the last question is someone asking if there's a group of country working on the UPR. Um, I don't know, maybe Jenny, if, if you want to, to say a, a few words on the, the role of UN country team um, in supporting the engagement of the UPR recommendation. Thank you, Mona, and I'll try to be telegraphic. So on the question of uh, the work of support to states and other stakeholders at country level, uh, it's not just to HCHR, it's the entire UN system. And I flag that there is already a repository of good practices of engagement of the UN system, which will be appearing in October uh, through the work of another international consultant, Alan Miller. And I think that we will see there some example of uh, what the UN system as a whole is doing, whether it's the Resident Coordinator's Office, UNDP, UN Women, UNICEF, UNFPA. So just to reassure everyone, implementation of the UPR support for implementation is for the UN system as a whole. That's the key message from the Secretary General and that's the key message we have received from the call to action. On the question of uh, partially accepted recommendation, they will be considered as noted or as uh, supported if uh, the state concern will be able to clearly identify which part of the recommendation is noted, which part is supported. If that is not possible, then the partially accepted will be counted by the Secretariat as noted overall. But even noted recommendation, as Sam have already flagged, uh, it does not mean that there isn't a commitment from the state to ensure follow-up or eventually 
to work on implementation, even though at the adoption they were not or partially accepted. Uh, with respect to the question asked on the study to be a part and parcel of the strengthening of the fourth cycle practices, the answer is yes. I think that there is already ongoing quite a number of efforts on preparing for the fourth cycle. A Milun study will be certainly one important point of reference. And as I said, uh, I know and I'm aware that many UN entities are looking at specific form of engagement and good practice when it comes to child rights, when it comes to the work of UNFPA, when it comes to issues that have to do with migrant refugees, displacement and related matters. So there is a great deal going on and I hope that those uh, experiences will be shared more broadly. On the question of using treaty body special procedures, I think the compilation is already doing what it can, taking into account that we have uh, limitations in words. But of course, next to us uh, flagging, concluding observation and recommendations uh, from this other mechanism, I think it's also important looking at the fourth cycle to ask uh, what this mechanism can do to utilize more effectively the entry point created by the UPR accepted recommendations, especially in areas that uh, fall within their mandate or fall within the specific concluding observation that was uh, made by the specific treaty body. But there was also a question on the parliament's role, critically important. Akio said everything that needed to be said. I would just like to add that uh, from our calculation, about 50% of recommendation in order to be implemented require parliamentary action. So enhancing the engagement, the role of parliaments, especially dedicated human rights committees is critical to the overall implementation agenda. And finally, there was a point on federal states. Yes, in federal states, we have to go beyond the federal level and engage in consultation dialogues and activities at states and local levels. And I understand that we have some good practices that could be further shared within this context. I hope that uh, looking ahead, we can take those into account. And finally, on the peace building prevention side, yes, the more we receive uh, from uh, stakeholder submissions that touches upon those issues or from UN entities, the more we will be able to reflect, even though we have the word count limitation into our documentation, which can then lead to member states making recommendation, highlighting also those issues. Over to you, Mona. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. And, and just to pull up on, on what Jenny said, I just would like to, to stress again that the, the, the UPR Mechanism Sport is an international forum. It really concerns, in fact, national issues. So that's why, in fact, the, the involvement and engagement of all stakeholders at the, at the national level are key you know, to, to ensure you know, the uh, effectiveness of the mechanism and the implementation of the UPR recommendation. And as Jenny said, um, doesn't mean that if a recommendation is noted or partially, even though it's not an official term, uh, accepted or, or, or rejected, that it doesn't have to be, uh, it cannot be implemented. Because when a government takes position at one point of time uh, during the adoption, it's because it's um, considered that at that time for some reason it cannot uh, commit to the implementation of recommendation. But as the UPI is a continuous uh, um, process and engagement, uh, as well as the realization of, of human rights, things can evolve in the country and state can take actions, even though the recommendation has been uh, noted to implement the, the UPI recommendation and go in a way for a better protection of rights. Um, yes, that is just a couple of points I wanted to say. And also we just wanted to say that we are going also to have a side event where we are going to share on the 8th of October good practices uh, from federal states for the implementation of UPR recommendation. 
Uh, there's a lot of interest, and I think probably we will have to organize an, another event, in fact, to, to share uh, good practices for the implementation of UPI recommendation. Uh, just, just one question that was raised, and we haven't responded yet in terms of the role of recommending state after the adoption. I would say probably two roles. One is uh, to, to support, in fact, the, the implementation uh, uh, of the UPI recommendation through technical assistance, uh, also to support the, the monitoring of the, of the UPI recommendation. Um, I think that our, and, and also definitely Peace Builder have played a critical role to prevent, in fact, uh, human rights violation and in the UPI process. So that is. Mona, there was a. Jenny, please, and then we have, we'll give also one minute after to the National Human Rights Commission of Morocco uh, that want to intervene. So, so Milun and after Akio, uh, very briefly. Yeah, Mona, no, I, I'm just responding to a question that is in the chat uh, by, by Philip from the Peruvian delegation um, on, on what is, the, you know, what has been the impact of the virtual sort of uh, UPR work. And, and I think uh, overall, uh, it's been very positive in the sense that many more people have been able to participate. So many more from a government delegation, many more from civil society. Uh, of course, the physical aspect is very important, but I would like to see a hybrid model developed, uh, even when we, you know, once we get over the COVID period, where we can continue in all the meetings, all the trainings, uh, all the work, uh, the, the hybrid model, so that more people can participate there are many who cannot come to Switzerland. There are many who, you know, it's much easier from their own country. So um, I think generally it's been positive and I hope those positive elements can, can be continued. Thanks. Thank you. So Akio and Gerald, uh, each briefly. Yes, very briefly, to, just to answer to the question from Cambodia, to say that we are organizing from 25th to 26th of October, um, capacity building um, workshop in, in person uh, workshop in Geneva and Cambodia is among those countries. But unfortunately, uh, when uh, we send the invitation, they told us that uh, uh, they are not allowed to leave the country due to COVID, maybe. Just to say that, but we'll send them the link because it is hybrid event, both in person and virtually. And we send the link to them and we hope that um, they will they can attend. Also to add that IPU is open, uh, but uh, just to let you know that we only provide capacity building upon request. If you can ask your parliament, your different parliament to get in touch with us, we are pleased, we'll be pleased together with OHCHR, IPU, uh, UPI info, sorry, and also Gunnery to support you, please. Uh, feel free to let me know at the IPU if you believe that we can, I mean, your parliament need assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Akio. And um, Gerald? Yeah, uh, I think thank you to the states for being very positive about this uh, process. Uh, I want to pick up uh, just a point about uh, the difficult issues uh, being no, uh, uh, recommended by other states. I think the, the, the rationale of the UPR is actually to encourage states to keep at it. So I think uh, uh, difficult issues, what some states will feel as uh, difficult. Yeah. Uh, can I please ask everyone to keep your mic on, on mute if you're not speaking? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I think uh, uh, that difficult uh, list or what we sometimes call noted or partial, I think are important markers from UPR 1, 2, 3, 4, as progression. And I think states must see it in that context. I think no one is asking for miracles. We know every state has that list, that difficult list, but not having it there is even uh, not a, a good way forward. So states must continue to use the universal framework of human rights value. Internally, in country, I would recommend like the NHRI in Malaysia with uh, MOFA and other agencies, we need to work on the reject list or the noted uh, or the partially raised to hope that in the next four years, eight years, 
that list can come back. I think it's not just the monitoring of what was accepted by the states, but also why the states keep pushing some away. I think that's a difficult task we agree, but we have to address that. And that's the critical nature of what the universal human rights standards and the role of uh, independent NHRIs and CSOs are there to actually keep calling out for those. And that for me is still very collaborative. Huh? Calling out the most painful issue for me is a form of respect and wanting to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And I would like just to give uh, the floor to Khalid from the National Human Rights Commission of Morocco. Um, thank you, Muna. Thank you uh, very much for uh, all those behind this very inspiring and important study. Uh, on the UPR processes, uh, namely OSHR and the UPR info, but also special thanks to Mr. Milun. Uh, uh, just very briefly and very quickly, so we in Morocco welcome this kind of initiatives and we see them as, um, uh, as a platform that help national human rights institutions to engage further on international human rights um, processes, including uh, the UPR. Um, we also, at the internal level here in Morocco, at the domestic level, we have been using the UPR information in our report, but also in our different engagements with the parliament uh, in order to impact on policy and legal uh, reforms. In our different submissions, memorandums, advisory opinions that we have submitted to the parliament, especially uh, or particularly regarding the reform of the penal code or the, the criminal act here in Morocco, we have been using the UPR info. We will continue to use the UPR because Morocco will go through the fourth session uh, very uh, soon, I think next year. So we will continue to use this uh, uh, process and to engage further with the uh, new government. There were elections here in Morocco and we are hopeful that the new government would uh, um, uh, respond further to our recommendations and to the recommendations in of the um, uh, U UPR. So we will continue to uh, engage with different stakeholders, including, including the parliament, the government, but also civil society organizations in order to optimize or to further optimize the outcome of the UPR process because we see it as a platform, as a roadmap, that uh, uh, help or that guide different stakeholders to advance the human rights agenda in uh, different countries. Thank you so much again for this inspiring study and uh, uh, my congratulations to all those who contributed to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khalid, for sharing the experience of the NHR from Morocco. Uh, I think we have now exceeded the time allocated to, to us. I have noted the uh, all the different points uh, in the chat. Uh, we will make a, a, a report of the event. And uh, we have taken into account that there's a lot of interest uh, on this issue of sharing good practices for the implementation of UPR recommendation. We're currently working also with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights as part of the consultation in view of the full cycle to share good practices uh, regarding the, the, the UPR. Uh, I will just give the floor again to Mr. Milun Kotari, and then we, we will conclude. Yeah, thanks very much, Mona. Uh, just a very quick point that uh, I, I'm, uh, I want to encourage uh, everyone who's listening today to uh, continue to uh, document good practices, uh, particularly, as I was saying before, to document good practices that show a change on the ground. You know, it's not enough to have policies and plans and strategies, but we actually need to see improvement of the human rights situation on the ground. And if you have good practices, please send them to OHCHR, send them to the organizers of this event. And we will continue to document. And I, I, I very much look forward to having more discussions like this. I know we ran out of time, but uh, I'm happy and I'm sure the co-sponsors would be happy to continue uh, these virtual discussions. Thanks very much, everyone. 
Thank you very much, uh, Milun. So I just saw last few free questions uh, on the chat, so I will respond briefly, but I really encourage you to, to if you have any further question, uh, to write to us, UPR Info is info at uprinfo.org, and we are happy to provide you more information. So one question was regarding children participation in the UPR. Indeed, there has been a coalition and group of children who have uh, submitted a, a report as part of the UPR process. And at UPR Info, we have also developed a guide to support children participation in the UPR process. And some have even participated to the session. There's a question related to the how you know um, development organizations support the UPR. And I have to say that a couple of countries have integrated the UPR in the development strategy, for instance, France and more recently Belgium, Switzerland also. So definitely uh, the UPR can be uh, uh, development, you know, um, I would say actors can support the implementation of the UPR and the UPR, if I want to say, is concerned really concrete human rights issues. So it's not about the, the process, but uh, that the issue arises using the, the mechanisms of, of the UPR. So definitely development actors can support the implementation of UPR recommendation. Um, so I think that was, uh, yes. And the last point is uh, involve uh, the role of uh, the judiciary. And yes, uh, judiciary law enforcement officials have a role to play in the implementation of UPR recommendation. And well taken note, and next time we will also invite a, a member of the judiciary uh, to, to speak about that. And that make the point about also the importance of ensuring that uh, an important uh, judiciary, but everything for the implementation of the legislation uh, require the involvement of law enforcement official and the judiciary. So I would like now to conclude. Um, this is all the time we have for today's discussion. And I would like to thank all our panelists, all the participants uh, today. Thank you for, very much for the rich discussion that we had. I would like to remind you that the study is available on the Office of the High Commissioner website as well on UPR Info website. To receive updates on UPR Info activities, you can follow up on our social media channels. Thank you again, everyone, for your participation, and I wish you a lovely day, lovely afternoon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, Mona. Bye, Milun. Thank you. Bye, Joseph. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mona. I, uh, I hope we have a record of the chat. There's some good information there. Yes, Milun, we have the, then on, on we can have uh, all the chat messages and send it to you as well. Okay, great. Thanks very much, everyone. That's great no, organization. Thanks. All the best. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.